1935. His hopeful words fit somewhere in between this prophet Hananiah and Jeremiah. So who do you want to believe? The prophet with the good news or the gloom and doom news anchor? Hananiah has told the people that the exile will be over in two years and King Nebuchadnezzar would return all the stuff he stole. Jeremiah says the problem with good news prophecy is you don't know if it's true until after the prophet is dead. How's that for a little light summer reading? (laughs) The image of the yoke figures prominently like last week's message. You recall the yoke is a contraption used to carry a burden, either on an animal or a person. And Jeremiah walks around town with a yoke around his neck to symbolize the difficult news that it is his duty to broadcast. But who wants to hear that? We like what Hananiah and the smooth-talking TV preachers say. Let's believe them instead. Then we don't have to think. Everything is so much easier that way. Around 150 years after Jeremiah, the Greek playwright Euripides said this, When one with honeyed words but evil mind persuades the mob, great woes befall the state. I don't know that Hananiah had an evil mind, He was probably just trying to get on his boss's good side so that he wouldn't get fired. His boss was King Zedekiah, ruler of what was left of the nation of Israel. Zedekiah was the news denier of his day. He had no room for compassion to his people or an understanding of God's purpose. Zedekiah was only about himself and what benefited his family. Zedekiah's evil mind had no interest in listening to Jeremiah. Jeremiah had the unenviable duty of telling the people that their lives of exile and living under foreign rulers was because they had strayed so far from the life God intended for them. No amount of sweet talk or simplistic campaign slogans and empty promises was going to change history. Because the rich took ever-increasing advantage of the poor, because the leaders of Israel only concerned themselves with enriching themselves instead of accepting and fulfilling their role on the world stage because the people turned their backs on God, they were going to learn the consequences. What are some of the consequences our country has seen? What was the consequence of the framers of our Constitution leaving in place the institution of slavery? A civil war, four score and seven years later, that left over 600,000 people dead, countless families ripped apart, and an attitude of North versus South that exists to this day. Ann and I were going down to uh, Georgia one time, and we couldn't leave until after work. And so we stayed in uh, Withville, West Virginia. And when, after midnight, we checked into the hotel, and the girl says, where are y'all from? And the 
said Ohio, and she said, that's all right, I had relatives on both sides. <laughs> what are the consequences of the Jim Crow laws that were enacted after the Civil War and supposedly abolished in 1964? You know, we've seen it just because we twice elected a black president, that doesn't mean racism has ended. If anything, this past year has shown a resurgence of hate and suspicion between the races. When the signers of the Declaration of Independence agreed that all men are created equal, how many women and people of color automatically knew they were excluded? Women haven't had the right to vote in our nation for even 100 years out of our 241 years of existence. Let that one sink in. Women's suffrage was only about 30 years old when my mother cast her first vote. It's only been four generations of American women that have been able to fully participate in this democracy. Women, by far the minority in Congress, are still being told to keep silent to sit down and shut up. It was people of the United Church of Christ that fought to abolish slavery. It was people of the United Church of Christ that continued to fight for equal rights for all. It was our forebears that lobbied for women's right to vote. And because all these things have been done, does not mean everything has been done. Women are still seeking equal pay for equal work. Money is stolen from public schools where fiscal accountability is a mandate and given to charter schools whose owner's only motivation is profit. We incarcerate prisoners at a higher rate than any other democracy. We execute the condemned as if we were a dictatorship. We assist refugees at a tiny fraction of the rest of the world while our nation consumes the most of the world's resources. We make a big deal out of who stands or kneels during the national anthem, and we want to pledge of allegiance set in schools while we deny liberty and justice for all based upon gender identity and sexual orientation. You think Jeremiah might have a few choice words for us. Our words matter. <clears throat> when we vote to become an officially recognized, open and affirming church, we are stating quite literally that we do not discriminate. Won't that be something? A church that lives up to the promise of what America claims. The challenge to living up to such a claim is that it takes effort. The people of Israel wanted to believe Hananiah's claim because it required no effort on their part. Just keep going the way you are, and everything will be in your favor. Walking around town wearing his yoke, 
Jeremiah said things are going to get a whole lot worse before they get better. Not a very good sales pitch. Nobody's buying that. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus doesn't hold out a false promise of a carefree life with no effort on our part. There is work, but it's joyful work. It's creating a community where all people are truly welcome, no matter their background or gender or any of society's labels. It is holding your government representatives to account to doing what is in the best interest of all people. It is taking care of our next door neighbor and our global neighbor. It is looking a refugee in the eye and saying, welcome. Amen.